people interpret music differently. They really do. Um, I think we all hear it differently. We all have a different relationship to music um, that's different from each other. And music, I think, is a very personal journey for people. And, uh, and I, I think that's good, and it should be that way, you know? Um, when I was first starting to write my own music, I became very uh, troubled by the fact that I would talk to somebody and they would have a different impression of what it was I was talking about in the song. And it really started making me sort of second guess what I was doing and how to write. And uh, was I being too vague? Uh, should I be a lot more concrete with my statements? Uh, how could I do this so that what I mean gets across to other people and it's not misconstrued? So I tried all kinds of different ways over the years and I've really just come to the conclusion that it's impossible. <laughs> You just have to write it the way you hear it. You write it the way you feel it and think it. And then some people are going to connect to it and others won't. And others will at certain times of their life if they're exposed to it. They'll discover that album and that album will mean something to them and they'll wonder why they never heard it before. And other people never hear it, you know. There's nothing you can do about that. You just have to kind of be true to yourself and true to your own idea. I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan, yeah, I love that band, I, I own every one of their records. Um, in fact, I was listening to Pink Floyd on the airplane yesterday, I was landing in Seattle. Yeah, and I, an album I hadn't heard in back, uh, Animals, hadn't heard that in a long time, and I listened to the whole thing. Yeah, we have connections to Pink Floyd in strange ways. Uh, Michael Kamen, who did a lot of the orchestration work with Pink Floyd on the wall and later albums, um, worked with us, Queensryche, on our first album, The Warning, also on um, Operation Mindcrime, and, and scored the orchestra for Silent Lucidity, too, from the Empire album. I also do have done uh, two albums with this uh, configuration called Sweet Oblivion, which is a, a kind of a project put together by the Frontier Record people in Italy. And uh, that's really fun. I've done two records with them. I'm getting ready to start a third one in the winter. That, that'll be fun, because I never know what I'm going to get or who I'm going to be working with. They just bring up some p people's names and they go, this is what we're thinking. What do you think? I go, let me listen to the material, you know? <laughs> I sang in Italian. Uh, the last uh, Sweet Oblivion album, I asked them, I said, I, I really want to do a song in Italian. They said, why would you want to do that? <laughs> I said, look, because it's an Italian record company, it's an Italian band, you know, I, I could do something in Italian, you know. We did the uh, Operation Mindcrime 30 anniversary tour a couple years ago that stretched into two years. And uh, we thought, oh, well, that worked really nice. Um, Empire's coming up on the 30 year anniversary, let's do that. So we started out doing that um, back in 2020, and then of course, you know, the pandemic struck. So we had to uh, cancel every, all the dates and postpone and rearrange. And I think most of the dates got uh, changed around three different times over the last couple of years. And so we're finally out and touring now uh, as of January and um, been having a great time playing the Empire album in its entirety and also Rage 4. My current band is made up of 20-year-old guys who are hungry and energetic, happy to be there, great players as well. You gotta be a good player to play with me, bottom line. Plus, I like them all. <laughs> you know, we all get along really nicely, right? And it's wonderful. I got these, these guys that play exceptionally every night they give it away every night on the stage, and they sweat, you know? They're not just up there playing the notes, they're living the notes, you know? They're giving it everything they got, and I, I respect that. Now, it may not be the original band, but if you shut your eyes, it sounds just like them.
When we toured with ACDC, well, a number of times, but uh, the first time, it was uh, amazing because they're an amazing band. And, and I, funny enough, I never was really that much into ACDC until we toured with them, and then I became a huge fan. Um, I guess I just hadn't been exposed to all their music, and on tour, of course, you hear things that, you know, you aren't on the radio, you know. Um, it was a tradition for the band to go out and go out after the show. I didn't know how they had energy to do this, but after the show, especially in Europe, you know, the, there's pub culture and you'd go out to the pub and have drinks. And uh, I didn't know this, but uh, uh, Brian would rent out the pub. He'd pack it full of 200 people or whatever, you know, and everybody would be drinking, telling stories, and he'd be holding court, having a great time. And he would never let you buy a drink, ever. He always pay for the evening every night, you know. So you'd be hammered, drunk, you know, face on the table, and they'd be scraping you into a cab to go to your hotel, and he'd still be talking, you know, after doing a two-hour, you know, arena show. He was one of a kind, that guy. I like to play golf. I don't think I'm what I would call a golfer because I'm not that good, because honestly I don't play enough. But I really like to play. And um, I got asked to do uh, VH1's uh, golf tournament thing they used to do all the time. I can't remember the name of it now. Hmm. Anyway, um, flew out to, I think it was someplace on the East Coast, maybe it was the, the Trump golf course, in fact. And uh, I hadn't played golf in a long time, so I wanted to get up early and hit some balls and find my swing again, you know. So I go out there and I'm slamming some balls, you know, warming up, doing the exercises, and I'm trying to work with this driver, right? Knock this ball, oh, it was like 150 feet, you know. <sighs> go to put my club away and as I turn around, Alice Cooper's standing there. Now Alice is an amazing golfer. He, uh, he's there for the tournament. I go, oh, hey, Alice. He goes, you like that club? I go, well, I, I kind of like it, but I, just, I don't know, I just haven't found it yet. And he goes, come with me. He takes me up to the, this trailer and uh, opens the door and he goes, Mike, this is Jeff. He needs a driver. And so Mike, the tailor-made guy, measures me and weighs me on a scale and makes me this custom-made driver. The whole time Alice is talking the guy's ear off and they're going back and forth, back and forth. It takes about 20 minutes and he makes me this amazing club. And uh, we go back down to the driving range and Alice says, well, give that a shot. So I get up there, you know, take my drive, like 300 yards, just boom, right off the, on my first swing, right? And I turn around, I'm smiling, he goes, that'll do. <laughs> and he left. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Came in and out of my life, just you know, like that, you know? Oh yeah, yeah, whenever I can. Yeah. Later when I started traveling the world with uh, the band and uh, going to all these different places and having wine with dinner, I really developed uh, a passion for it. And that led me to uh, making my own and, and having my own brand, which I do now, it's called Insania. We've been making wine since 2007. And uh, we have a red, white, a red and a white wine. Uh, the red is uh, Pinot Noir, and the white is Pinot Grigio. And we make it in uh, southwestern Germany, which uh, is um, a lovely, beautiful place where they've been making wine for thousands of years, you know, since the Romans came. And the family uh, that I work with, uh, the Rinkland family, uh, own the winery and own the vineyards, and they're my wife's relatives. And uh, they were the first to make organic wine in Germany. And uh, so all of our Wine is organic, and they call it bio in Europe, and uh, it's fantastic. It's a it's a beautiful place. Um, it smells amazing. <laughs> if you if you go there, it's like everything's so natural and unpolluted. You know, it's clean, and uh, they don't allow any pesticides or anything like that. You know, to uh, you know, permeate the grapes or the vineyards or anything like that. So it's it's like it, you're walking through the Garden of Eden. You know.
couple years ago, my wife and I started this company called Backstage Pass Travel. Okay. And you can find it at backstagepasstravel.com. And what we do is we offer people the uh, chance to go on trips with us, week-long trips. And we take them in-depth traveling to uh, places we love. Uh, we take them to Ireland, uh, Italy, France. Um, we have uh, two uh, tours in America, one in Montana and one in the Northwest here. Uh, we have one in Rio de Janeiro that's coming up. Um, places we love, uh, we take people and show them around. And the idea is that they get kind of an in-depth um, experience, a unique experience because We've been to these places so many times, we know all the cool places to go and cool things to see, and we can steer you clear of the things that will be disappointing too. And basically, you get to where we meet up, and we got you from then on. You don't have to worry about a thing. You know, we take, we supply your transportation and your lodging, um, and uh, we go to the best restaurants, and uh, we have uh, the best experiences, really. We play shows, we have friends, we have family in a lot of places. Um, our tours are really based around music, really. And we have uh, local musicians that sit in. We do pub crawl all through Ireland when we're on that trip. Uh, Ireland has amazing music, and uh, it's, it's all original music, you know, and they've got also a long history of, uh, of uh, folk music, and, and uh, it's fascinating to experience, and a lot of people that means a lot to them, you know, and they want to experience that. And all of our musicians come to us and, and they, um, we have music every day in every situation we're in. There's uh, somebody playing, you know, whether it's me or uh, uh, somebody that's sitting in. And uh, sometimes we'll go to a pub or a club and I'll get up and do a couple songs with the people that are playing there. Uh, sometimes we bring our guests up on stage and they, they uh, if they're a singer or a player, you know, uh, they sit in with us and play some stuff. You know, it's, it's very fun. One of the really interesting things about backstage past travel that people should uh, recognize, I think, is that they get to go and have these experiences with people that are very experienced in the place they're at. They're not just going into London, for example, cold. You know, they're going with somebody that's been to London, I don't know, 40 times and knows the city and knows where to go and could point you in the right direction. So. A lot of times people are hesitant about going overseas and traveling because they've never been there, they don't know what to do, what to go. And uh, I think it's a comforting thing when they come with us because they don't have to worry about that. And they have a, an amazing time and see things that nobody they know would ever see, right? Yeah, you get a year, you get a year of backstage passes to any of my shows. So it's fun because you've just spent this intense week with people and then you know, you say your goodbyes and usually it's hugs and, and kisses, you know, and you leave and maybe two months later you're playing their town, you know. Well, they have a free pass to come to the show and they come to the show and they hang out and they, you know, you have maybe have dinner with them and that kind of thing.